All right, well, good morning. As we're getting our way through Hebrews, we're making our way pretty fast. And we've only got a couple more chapters left. 11, 12, and 13, and we'll be done. We'll get into our Christmas series, whatever that may be. So, As you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, I want to remind you that... Uh, a key concern in this epistle, who, who I think was Paul, was to remain strong in the faith. He was encouraging Jewish believers not to turn back to their old religion, but to remain in their faith in Christ, who was the fulfillment of all their Jewish uh, law, their Jewish requirements, the Jewish sacrifices, that he was the Lamb of God. He warned them of developing a, a, a heart of unbelief in chapter 3 and reminded them of the lack of faith that destroyed Israel in the wilderness. In chapter 10 last week, we saw that an exhortation to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, and he admonished them to have faith which endures to the end. What is this faith that he's speaking of, and how can we have it? This faith... faith that manifests itself in the lives of those who possess it is what we're going to see here as a reminder in chapter 11. We find the definition of faith in verse 1. We have a mention of how necessary faith is to please God in verse 6. And we have examples after example of Old Testament saints who demonstrated saving faith. And so the first seven verses that we're going to examine, the faith that pleases God. Let's go ahead and read those first seven verses and we'll get through that. Chapter 11, Hebrews, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet speaks. And by faith, Enoch, which translated, which, sorry, was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen, as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And we're going to pause there and talk about those first seven verses. First, we see the explanation of what faith is. That's a good place to start, isn't it? What is faith? And I ask my family this, I ask my kids this, and kind of, you know, just kind of a preliminary conversation with, what is faith to you? Is it just believing in belief? No, it's beyond that. It's not just believing, it's not just having faith in faith itself, it's having faith in someone. But faith is confidence. It's conviction. It's not faith that's blind. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you need to have blind faith. You know? But there's this idea in our culture, isn't there, that you need to have blind faith. No. Faith is the evidence of things unseen. Okay? So if we really take that to what it means, faith is a substance of things hoped for. The Greek word translated substance is actually hypostasis, which literally means to stand under, to be a foundation, the substructure. I could ask Paul, who, who's been a firefighter, hey, what's left when the fire ransacks a building? The foundation, right? Every, well, everybody knows that, right? The foundation will endure. And we don't want to base our faith on anything other than a strong foundation, a solid rock, right? So the Greek word for the translated substance, hypostasis, literally means to stand under, to be a foundation, a substructure, a real being, confidence, firm trust, 
and assurance. It is the evidence. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. And the word for evidence in this verse, I'm not going to try to pronounce it for you, but it means conviction or proof. Proof by which a thing is proved or tested. Faith is a confidence and a conviction. And this pertains to things hoped for and not seen. Faith is confidence about things hoped for, such as the coming of our Lord. In Titus 2.13, it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. We're looking forward to something. And if we weren't looking for, forward to that, if we didn't know about Jesus' prediction that He was coming back, that He told us He would come back, that He's going away to prepare a place for us, we wouldn't have any hope in that, would we? But it's because He told us that, He reassured us with His resurrection of many miracles and signs, we can have faith. It's the evidence of what He said, what He proved. We also have hope for the resurrection of the dead. Have any of you ever seen the resurrection of the dead? No. There's movies, but no. Not in real life. You have not seen the dead raised to life. Now, there may be some miraculous situations where things just, uh, God does something outside the ordinary uh, spectrum, but this resurrection of the dead is also something that we're hoping for, not because of things we've seen, right? But it is what we're hoping for. Uh, Acts 24, 15 says, And that we have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. That includes everybody. Not just the good ones, and not just the bad ones. Both. And God's going to separate the sheep from the goats, right? But it was this kind of confidence that the Old Testament saints had, and that they stood on. The foundation that God's word is true. He is faithful. He is believable. Faith is a conviction about things that we have not seen. The first thing that he says here, in, in what is that, verse 3, about faith, he talks about the creation of the world. And I think that's a great place to go back to when you're having trouble understanding what faith is or, or just believing. Maybe you have some family members that you're going to visit this week that are having trouble just believing. And I shared this story with you when I was a kid. I struggled with just simple belief. God, if you're real, show me a sign. He doesn't have to do that. I was struggling in my own belief, right? He created the universe. He created the heavens. When I'm driving across the desert every week in, in New Mexico and I look up and there's no there's no light interference, and I see the millions of galaxies and the glory of His heavens, I know that didn't happen by accident. That was God's creation. And it's an amazing thing. A lot of us don't get to see that because of all the light pollution here in the city. But the existence of God, whom no man has seen or, or can see, in 1 Timothy 6.16, he says it this way, who only has or immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And in Hebrews 11.3, it says that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. That what you see was made by something that you cannot see. Matter came into being by something that's not matter. How that works is a mystery. I don't think we'll ever figure it out materialistically. But science is showing us that there is a non-local existence, that things do pop in and out of existence kind of randomly. They can't explain it. They're trying to. They're saying that there's another level of existence or there's another dimension. They are showing that this is actually the case. There is something beyond what we see. I assume that science is probably going to come up with some other explanation other than God. Okay, so be ready for that because it's probably coming. But when it says in verse 2 that the elders obtained a good testimony, he's talking about the elders of the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints. Because of their faith, and the rest of this chapter is filled with illustrations of faith possessed by these elders. First three mentioned were antediluvians. And what is antediluvian but pre-flood? Okay, Those that were living before Noah's flood. And in them we see, first of all, that faith 
is exemplified. We have the testimony of Abel. Abel was worshiping. By faith, he offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And this is out of Genesis 4, if you want to look at that on your own. But Cain's offering was of the fruit. Abel's offering was of the firstborn of his flock. And I think there's an interesting difference here. If you, if you haven't really examined the sin, it even goes back to works versus faith. What is fruit of the ground but something you have to... Didn't, didn't God say to Adam, you have to work the ground with the sweat of your brow? But when you have a flock... You're not really working the ground, are you? You're trusting in God for them to reproduce, right? I mean, you could do, you know, you could build a fence and put this goat with that goat or that sheep with that sheep, but really it's in God's hands at that point, okay? Whether life is going to happen or not. And so I think there's an interesting another level of their sacrifice here that Cain's offering was more of a works based offering, Abel's offering was more of a faith based offering. For whatever reason, however you want to look at it, God was more respecting. Abel's offering than Cain's. Doesn't really say why. I'm, I'm kind of adding two here, but, but there's some layers there that we might want to look at. Abel's offering was a blood offering. Cain's offering was a, whether it's grain or fruit, I don't know, but it was the first fruit of the ground. Okay. We don't know why God respected one but not the other, but there may be some hints. Cain's attitude was certainly wrong when he saw that God respected Abel's offering. It led him into sin. It led him to murdering his brother. And so if we find ourselves in a works-based salvation and we see somebody else that God is honoring, we might be a little jealous. You might be a little jealous if you were in that situation, that God is honoring somebody's offering that they didn't even really work hard to give. Okay. But through faith, Abel obtained witness that he was righteous, it says. God certainly testified of his righteousness in showing respect to his offering. Jesus also bore witness of righteousness of Abel in Matthew 23. Also, the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 3. And through his faith, Abel still speaks, even though he's dead. He's an example of faith written for our learning, according to Romans 15. And his example of faith continues to warn us in regards to worshiping God. We still have a responsibility to worship God and to not be caught up in a works-based salvation, a works-based worship. And then after Abel, we see the testimony of Enoch. So Abel was had the faith... In worshiping, Enoch has a faith in walking. He was walking with God. Remember in, uh, in Genesis, it says that Enoch did not see death, but that he was translated. I don't know exactly what that means, but it sounds like he just automatically went to heaven. Okay? God somehow translated it from this existence to the heavenly realm. Okay? And I don't know how that works. I don't need to know how that works. That's what it says, and that's what I believe. The historical reference alluded to Genesis 5, and like Elijah, he did not experience death. Elijah also was caught up to heaven in a similar manner. But it ultimately it says that his faith was such that he pleased God. And what, was, what was it that God found pleasing? It was that he walked with God. So we too have the example of not only Abel in our worship, worshiping God, but we can also walk with God by faith. Enoch's example illustrates the value of walking with God throughout our whole life. Not just when we get saved and then we go do whatever we want. Or come on a Sunday morning and then the rest of the week we party like it's 1999 or whatever, right? But that we're walking with God day by day, okay? And then we have the testimony of Noah. His faith worked. It wasn't that he was working to be saved, but if he didn't obey God, he... He would have drowned with everybody else, right? So he had some work to do, and it was by faith. But it says that by faith, Noah moved with godly fear. And we see this in Genesis 6, if you want to see the whole story. But God warned him about things that were not seen. They didn't have weather forecasters back then to tell them that there's a flood going to happen. God told them directly, hey, there's a flood. And you know, it never rained before Noah's flood. 
though it says the ground the ground is where the water came up from and there was a mist but there was never any rain that we know of before this so when noah is out there as a righteous preacher it says preaching to the generation hey it's going to rain can you imagine the foolishness that everybody thought what he was going to say what what he was saying was something that had never happened before you're crazy man go go build your little ark or whatever okay they thought he was crazy they didn't listen and they got the ultimate judgment. God warned him about things not seen, so he moved with godly fear, and he had confidence in what God said would happen and prompted him to act accordingly with reverence toward God. By faith, Noah prepared an ark for the saving of his household. And do you think that maybe, this is, this is getting into hypothetical land here, so it's not scripture, just, if there was a, a person, even one person or a family of people, that said, hey, Noah, I believe you, don't you think Noah would have let him on the ark? I think he would have. But it says that God closed the door when it started raining, when all the animals were on, God closed the door. And that was it. There was no one else coming on board at that point. He let his faith work, and God condemned the world as a result. His example of faithfulness stood in stark contrast to the rest of the world, and his obedience magnified the lack of obedience in others. Just like Nineveh, when Jonah went to them, they're going to be condemned, those who do not listen to Jesus. When God comes back, it's going to be like the flood. It's going to be hell on earth for those. All right, let's look at uh, faith emphasize. We've seen the testimony of those first three. Now let's look at some others. In verse 6, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. He emphasizes what faith is. He, we've seen Abel, Enoch, and Noah. They obtained a good testimony by the faith of Enoch. In particular, it said that he pleased God. And whether we're worshiping, walking, or working, faith must be the motivating factor behind it all. Without faith... There's nothing we can do to please God. You could build the biggest ark and say you're doing it for God. You could build the biggest mega church and say you're doing it for God. But unless you have faith, it's for nothing. Faith is what pleases God. Without faith, there's nothing that we can do that will please God. So what is the faith that pleases God? First of all, it's a conviction that we believe that God is. We must believe that there is a God, that He is the God of the Bible. And though we don't see Him, we have a conviction in things not seen, as it says. This includes a confidence that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So we must believe that God acts on the parts of those that seek after Him. And it's regarded such things hoped for that we must have confidence. So how is saving faith developed? You know, in fact, I want to stop just for a second because there's several different kinds of faith. We have faith when we believe initially. That's, you believe that God exists. That's one thing. You believe on Jesus Christ for your salvation. That's another. You believe that God raised Him from the dead. I think that's part of the salvation experience, right? But then I think God also gives certain people an extra gift of faith. You know, in Corinthians, He talks about the spiritual gifts. Some people have a gift of faith. It's just a little bit more than the rest. When they pray, it seems to be stuff happens. I don't fully get it. I don't understand it. But I want those people praying for me, right? I want those people on my team. And some people don't have that kind of faith. Some people struggle having faith at all, right? And maybe it just seems like everything just, it's just hard to have faith because everything's going bad. And I do want to say this, just because things are going good or just because things are going bad doesn't mean that God doesn't necessarily favor you. Really, you're going to have to get with God. You're going to have to get with him one-on-one -on -one to figure out if what you're doing, if what bad things might be happening to you, if that's God's discipline, ask him. Or maybe it's just life circumstances. We don't always know. True faith is going to believe either way, that uh, whether it's bad stuff happening to you in the world, persecution is going to come, people are going to have to be ready to die for their faith. Okay, That's not necessarily God's judgment on you. That might just be the world hates you. They hated Jesus, remember? It's going to hate us too. So there's, there's different aspects of faith. I just want to put that out there, that there's saving faith. There's also a gift of faith that I think some people can have over and above that the church age was given 
for the purpose of building up one another. Okay. Let's go ahead and go on to uh, the next few verses here. We see that we worship God, we can walk with God, we can work for God. We also need to see that faith embraces these promises. Just like these characters in verses 8 through 22, we're going to see they embraced the promises of God, even without seeing forward what Jesus was going to do to fulfill those promises. So let's read verses 8 through 22. If you'd read with me, um, follow along, 8 through 22. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in a tabernacle with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. Because she judged him faithful who had promised, therefore sprang there even of one and him as, a, as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sands which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things... Yeah, I'm going I'm to keep going here. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Verse 15, And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned, but now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. I'm going to stop there. Well, actually, no, I'm going to go to verse 22. Accountability, verse 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Verse 20, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Verse 21, by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both his sons of Joseph and worships, leaning upon the top of his staff. And by faith Joseph, when he had died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Let's stop there. So by faith, let's talk about the patriarchs. Let's first look at Abraham. By faith, he obeyed. He was living in an ungodly, idolatrous land with tons of gods. Okay, He left to follow the one true God. God called him to leave his country. He obeyed the voice of the Lord. And even though at first he did not know where he was going, this is an example of conviction in things not seen. There was something, but it wasn't seen. And here we see that faith and obedience are not contradictory terms. Indeed, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Is our faith obedient faith like Abraham's? In Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, And why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Do you call Jesus, Lord, Lord, and not do what he says? By faith, it says he sojourned. What does that mean? It means he traveled in a foreign land. He was a stranger. He was an alien in a foreign land, right? His faith required him to live in a strange country. And all, even though it was the land of promise, he and his descendants could not have it for 400 years forward. He therefore patiently waited for the city, whose builder and maker is God. That's kind of cool, isn't it? They're waiting for the heavenly city, the heavenly country. Even though they're traveling and they're looking to obey God, they're looking for a country and a city that they have never seen. They've never been there but they're going. Can you imagine like the pilgrims on the boat? It is Thanksgiving week. Never been there, 
but you're going by faith. You're getting on a boat that may cost you your life. You've been persecuted in you know, those other countries that they were in. You're getting on a boat to be able to practice your freedom of religion in a new land where it might be dangerous. You might starve. You might die at sea. But they, they have faith of a country not yet in existence. We too have to have that same kind of faith. We need to have the pilgrim kind of faith that Abraham had, that the pilgrims had. We are looking not for this country to save us, not for this place to be God's city, but for that city which God is going to provide. We too are strangers and pilgrims in this land. Our faith needs to be a sojourning faith like Abraham's, realizing that we can't get too comfortable where we're at. This is not our home. Just like Abraham left all that he knew. And then we see faith... The faith of Isaac. Uh, excuse me, actually, no. Faith of Abraham we're still on because he offered up Isaac. And if you know the story, it was kind of strange because God asked him to offer up his son. The one son that he said that he was going to transmit all his blessings through. That his descendants would be as numerable as the stars of heaven and the sand on the sea through this one son. And now God's asking him to sacrifice his son. Why would God do that unless... You know, you're trying to justify this in your mind. What would you say? But he must have justified it thinking that, well, if, if God's asking me to do this, he must be able to raise him from the dead because I believe his promises. He cannot lie. He must be true. Right? So what does he do? He offers up his son. He didn't count his son's life more than his own. He, he put more weight into God's promises. And of course, we know, hindsight, that God provided an alternative with the ram stuck in the thicket. And isn't that an amazing uh, foreshadowing of things to come where God provided his own sacrifice on our behalf through Christ and what he did on the cross? God knew, and he was showing us through the promises and, and the testimony of these Old Testament saints what was to come. Things that they had no clue of that God's Son was going to give Himself an offering like that. Do we have more love for ourselves or even our loved ones than God? We need to forsake those things closest to us. Perhaps there's some things that you're holding on to, even family members or, or loved ones, that really you need to give up and just have your faith on God. Maybe some family members are keeping you from fully embracing or, or being obedient in what God has called you to do. We can't do that. Our closest loved one is the one that Satan might use to keep us from doing God's will. We have to be mindful of that and keep a steadfast focus on what God has called us to do. If our family truly is trying to serve God, they're going to come along with you. If God is really calling you to do what you're doing, your family's going to be right there. Your loved ones are going to be right there supporting you if they're following God, right? Then we have the faith of Sarah, Abraham's wife. She received strength, it says, to conceive a child in her late years. I think she was, what, 95? That's a little bit old to conceive your first child, right? <laughs> you would think that's impossible, but not with God. She laughed because it's impossible, right? But later she judged him as faithful who had promised. God is faithful. And when he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And through her faith, the promises of a great nation were fulfilled. Our faith requires looking to God for strength. Our faith requires us to trust that he will provide for all of our needs. We must look to God to find grace to help us in our time of need. Is your faith a receiving one like Sarah's? And we have the faith of Isaac. Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau regarding the things to come. He knew of the blessing that Abraham uh, put down, and he blessed Jacob and Esau. And then we have the faith of Jacob. Jacob blessed his sons, the sons of Joseph, even when he was dying. His blessing involves the promises of God and showing how he embraced them also. And then we have the faith of Joseph. If you remember his life, he had kind of a rough beginning. His brothers were bullying him, picking on him, sold him into slavery. 
And yet he had faith in God, probably because of his father's faith. His father had to have taught him that, right? But by the end of Joseph's life, he gave some peculiar instructions regarding his bones. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if when I was about to die and I told my kids, hey, I want my bones brought with you when you move and, and you need to bury them wherever you're going to move to, I would, I'd say, okay, Dad, we're going to do whatever we want, though. <laughs> we might not follow what he wants, uh, um, but this was his dying request. And when you make an oath to a dying person, you're kind of inclined to keep it. You know? But the whole purpose of this, because he saw the promise that was coming. Joseph knew the promised land was where the Messiah was going to be. He knew that this was Egypt was not the promised land. He knew the promised land because Abraham, great-grandfather or grandfather, was already there. He had already observed it, already scattered it out, and for some reason, you know, they were in Egypt. Joseph did not want his bones staying in Egypt. He wanted them to go with him. So that, that was evidence of his faith as well, that even moving his bones in his death would be an act of faith. All right. Well, let's look at how their faith pleased God. Verses 13 through 16, we see that they embraced the promises. They did not receive the promises during their lifetime, but... With faith, they could see them far off. And I think with us too, we have hope in what God's going to do, even though we may not see it. We have to kind of use our imagination, don't we, sometimes? We have to imagine, um, just thinking about our lost loved ones. We have to use our imagination to imagine that they could be saved. Because it's not what we see. We're not seeing it with our own eyes. We're having to use our spiritual eyes. We're having to kind of forecast, okay, God, this person... I know when you change their heart, they're going to be a different person. Yeah, they might have some, some of the same quirks. You know, we all do, right? We have, we have our biology, we have our quirks about us, but God put a new heart in you. He, put, he puts a new person inside of you. You have a fresh start. You are born again, and only God can do that. We have to look at that in others. We have to look forward that God is going to save some people in our life and, and be ready for that. You might not even know, it might not even be who you expect. In fact, oftentimes it probably isn't who you expect. I remember in college, I was praying for two different girls who were pregnant. I was praying that one said she was going to get an abortion. And I was praying, God, please don't let her get an abortion, please. And this other girl who was planning on keeping it. And I, I prayed real hard for the one that said she was going to get an abortion. Well, she didn't get an abortion. The other one did that I wasn't praying for. And I don't know if that's a salvation situation, but just an example of how we can we don't know who we should be praying for sometimes. God does, which is why we have a high priest. He's standing at the right hand of God. And he interprets our prayers for us. He knows how we need to be praying. And so just pray. Let Him guide your prayers even. Let Him lead your prayers. Say, God, hey, I don't know what I should be praying for, God, but lead me in my prayer. You know, and, and just listen. You know, listen to God. Use your spiritual ears and tune in to what He may be praying for. He may be working through you in ways that you have no idea. So not only did they embrace their, the promises of old, but it also says that God was not ashamed to be called their God. I sure hope God's not ashamed to be called our God. I hope that our actions are pleasing to God. I hope that despite what we do, God is not ashamed of us. It says that He was well pleased with them. It says that their faith, embracing the promises, that that's what pleased Him. It wasn't our actions. It wasn't our sin. that we, I know we all have. We all have a history of past. That's not what God's looking at. He's looking at your faith. That's what pleases God. So don't let the sin, the shame of your sin, of your past, shame you into thinking that God's not pleased with you. It is your faith alone that can please God. Okay? Not what you do. In fact, all the good stuff that you do, remember the Bible says it's filthy rags. So no matter how much good stuff you do, you can't pile enough good stuff to outweigh the bad stuff that we've done. It's impossible. It isn't possible. Faith is what pleases God. We have a promise to look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein there does dwell righteousness. There is no sin. It's the new Jerusalem, the great city descending out of heaven as we read in Revelation 21. Indeed, even now, in a sense, we have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, as it will say in the next chapter we'll get to next week in Hebrews chapter 12. 
What kind of faith pleases God? Certainly a worshiping faith like Abel. A walking faith like Enoch. A working faith like Noah. But also a waiting faith seen in the patriarchs. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. I hope that we will obey His calling. I hope that we will sojourn here on earth as strangers. And we can offer up whatever He asks of us. That we'll receive strength, we'll receive strength to do whatever He has for us. And that we'll make mention of His promises to all generations after us. This is the kind of faith that God is not ashamed to be called their God. And then we have faith that overcomes the world. These last few verses. Let's, let's finish this chapter. Verse 23, I'm going to start there. I'll finish out the chapter. It says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Sometimes we've got to disobey authorities to obey God, right? That's what they were doing. Verse 24, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Verse 27, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. Verse 30, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that, had, that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I say more, it says, for the time would fail me to foretell of Gideon, of Barak, and of Samson, and of Japheth, and of David also, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Anybody ready to do that? <laughs> I saw a video the other day of a lion that was loose from a circus walking through a town. What would you do? A full-pledged lion walking down the street. You know, it's easy to lock our doors. But if you had some kids playing out in the yard, would you just lock the door? No. You'd have to have some faith, wouldn't you? You'd have to go out there and get the kid, save the kid. Hopefully the lion would not realize what's going on. Verse 34, let's read on. Quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. This goes on and on, doesn't it? Out of the weakness, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. <laughs> Sounds like an end times battle. <laughs> Talk about the foreigners coming in to invade. Okay. 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Verse 36, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain were sword, with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Verse 39, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having proved some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. We could go through each one of those saints, each one of those phrases, and really expound on each of those, but I don't have time. And it's... You're going to be hungry if we go through all that. The thing is, I, I think the most important part of this is, yes, there are people that suffer for Christ. And we need to realize that just because, you know, we're suffering things doesn't mean we're displeasing God. There are things, it's okay to not have 
the nicest jacket. We might have to suffer. We might have to be running out in the woods. We might have to be having a little starvation. We might get a little bit uh, thrown in jail. We might be having a little bit of mockings or scourgings for our faith. We might be thrown, you know, all these things. That's a lot. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Do you get the persecution that they were getting these saints? They're getting the worst of it. And yet it says, of whom the world was not worthy. Those that have faith, it's kind of interesting, that the world is not worthy of your presence. Think about that. And it's not because of you and how good you are. It's because of God living inside of you. It's because of what God is doing inside of you. It's the faith that you're exhibiting. They didn't receive the praise of the world. You're not going to get the praise of the world. Whether you have to wander in the deserts and the mountains, live in a cave like Elijah, the world's not worthy of them. But they did obtain a good testimony. Just like the elders in verse 2, Enoch in verse 5, you may have to suffer some things. The world is going to hate you. Even if you don't see the second coming. You may be living with that hope that God is just right around the corner. That He's going to come back any day now, and He is. But you may not see it. That day may escape us. It may just be another generation. I don't know. It sure seems like the times are getting closer. What's the one thing that they all had in common? All these people here in chapter 11, they all had faith that truly overcame the world. And so that's my hope for you, is that you'll have faith... First of all, that saves. Some of us will have more faith than others when it comes to just daily living. And as a gift to the church, you'll have an extra amount of faith to pray for one another. There's also a faith that's going to help us to endure to the end. It's going to overcome the world. And our victory is going to seem miraculous. Our victory may be in our death. It may be in our martyrdom. In fact, that's kind of the way I read Revelation when it talks about the Antichrist overcoming the saints. That's what it means, is that we're going to be martyrs. We're going to be killed for our faith. We're not going to be left dead. God is coming back. He's going to resurrect us. We're going to rule for a thousand years in the millennial kingdom. And then even then, at the end of the thousand years, God has preserved a couple nations, Gog and Magog, that are going to be raised up and used by Satan to attack once again. There will be the final battle at the end of the thousand-year millennial. Not now. Gog and Magog is not for now. There may be some involvement now, but ultimately it's preserved for that after the thousand-year millennial kingdom. So, Enjoy what you can of the presence of the Lamb. Look towards the end of your faith. Understand that victory is always going to be God's, and nothing in this world is going to overcome you. Even death is not going to win. It may seem like it wins. You may have your cut, throat cut. You may take a bullet for your faith. You, whatever is go, the most atrocious thing in the world, imagine, yes, that may happen to us. But the victory ultimately is with God. And if we're faithful to the end, we're going to get rewarded for that. God knows what you're going through. God knows what you're going to endure for Him. So I hope that this chapter, with its heroes of faith, the hall of heroes, as it's, it may be called, serves to motivate us, that we will grow in the faith, that we'll strive to be like these um, heroes, that will please God, that will embrace the promises, and that will overcome the world. We may not win the praise of the world, but we will receive the praise of God, for such is the faith which leads to the saving of God's people. Next week we'll get into chapter 12, and then we really only have one more chapter, so two chapters. And uh, Jesus, he's, the whole point of this, He's trying to get people who are Christians 
to look at the race set before us, as it says in verse 1 of chapter 12, that, that you would look towards the goal, finish the race. Don't quit halfway through. Don't give up because it's hard.